So I'm gonna look through the comments right now and select titles I have never heard of. I don't know what they look like and I'm just trusting you to recommend things in the correct categories. <laughs> like, what do you mean why fish don't exist? <laughs> I have a list of books I've never seen, so why not predict how they look? Naturally, like seven moons and moon phases make sense to go across the top. The last one is the wedding season. It's your favorite color. It's my favorite color? Yeah. I really thought this would be the one. I thought I was gonna love this. I sense a five star coming. I literally just did not know like what the point of any of this was. Whoever's in charge here. I just need a five star romance. I just need to feel alive. Hello friends, I'm Kayla, welcome back to my channel. I recently did a video where I explored what all of my five star reads have in common. The themes and tropes and ideas that often exist in my favorite books. I came up with a list of categories and at this point for you, I have now done a follow up vlog where I read a bunch of the books that I thought fit into those categories. So I listed my favorite things and then I also made a little TBR. And then there was a follow-up vlog and this is my other follow-up vlog where I read your recommendations because the comments ended up full of ideas for me to read. Now the gimmick of this vlog is I'm gonna pick books, I'm gonna look through the comments right now, and select titles I have never heard of, I don't know what they look like, and I'm just trusting you to recommend things in the correct categories. <laughs> so that's my challenge is to go through the comments and find books that I've never heard of. Maybe I can predict what they look like. What I'm gonna do is jot down the titles and authors and give this list to my husband. He's gonna shop for the books and then I'm going to react to them live as they show up in my life. Now, of course, there's gonna be books that I've heard of that you're recommending to me that I'm sure I already agree with. I've already put them on my radar, like S by J.J. Abrams for mixed media. Braiding Sweetgrass as an informative memoir, I see that one. I've heard of boyfriend material and I do wanna read that someday for fake dating. Okay, here's one I haven't heard of. Smriti recommended me 84 Charing Cross Road because it's a book about books, which is one of my categories. She said, it's these letters that were written between one woman in New York and the people who worked in a bookstore in London. It's a true story and it's amazing. Short and just so cute. Okay, I don't know the author of that one, but I don't wanna search it. So hopefully Rob will be able to figure out what it is. Okay, this one is from channel member Amy who said Why Fish Don't Exist by Lulu Miller as an informative memoir. And there's something about that title that really is calling to me. Like, what do you mean why fish don't exist? <laughs> Another channel member, Lauren Anna commented, for your female female relationship at any cost category, check out The Jasmine Throne by Tasha Suri. It's the first book in an India inspired sapphic fantasy series and it's so good. The tension, the tension, feminist adult fantasy at its best. Okay, one for non-urgent apocalypse. Katie Brennan commented, a recommendation for The Last by Hannah Jameson. Lots of not knowing what's going on. Read it a few years ago, haven't stopped thinking about it. I know I have a book called um, The Last, I have a book called The Last Something on my TBR. I don't think it's the same one, but I'm always looking for apocalyptic books. Ooh, somebody else recommended Why Fish Don't Exist. Erin said it's about queerness, eugenics, taxonomy, depression, and a murder mystery? Wait, what? Oh, somebody else recommended The Last by Hannah Jameson. LG said that one. Interesting. Maybe I have seen it somewhere, but it's definitely not coming to mind right now. Okay, Lindsay said The Seven Moons of Molly Almedi by Sheehan Karanitilaka. Sorry. It's related to death and has an organized countdown aspect. Plus it's weird and insightfully written. Solid endorsement and I really like the title. So at this point, it seems to me like my list that I'm creating is pretty like heavy topics or more serious subject matter. So I definitely need to grab something that is in the wedding category or the fake dating category. Something romantic, something light. So Victoria said The Wedding Season by Katie Birchall. This is both wedding, a wedding setting and list oriented. Angela said, do you take this man by Denise Williams is a wedding related romance. So I'm gonna give this list to Rob. He's going to acquire all of the books whenever they arrive. I will check in with you. Actually, first, I might predict what these covers look like. I have a list of books I've never seen, so why not predict how they look? Rob has been given the list. He said they're all acquirable, at least most of them at the library. So while he's figuring that out, um, 84 Charing Cross Road, uh, I think is like a bookstore story. So why not just find a photo of a bookstore and just like find some elements together. 
a good brick front and then pop in the windows. I feel like there should be a cat in the window. I think maybe I'm thinking of another book, another cover, but I think there should be a cat in the window. And then the title will just be um, the name of the store. And I don't have an author name. So it's kind of ugly, but that's my prediction. That is my prediction for 84 Charing Cross Road. First book is 84 Charing Cross Road. Why is it so small? Ooh, okay, it's got books. Uh, it's inside a bookstore, not from the front. I got the vibe. It's a lot of titles. Did I tell you I designed these? What oh, no. I had in my mind because I've never seen them. That's why this is a secret and you had to order them all. Why Fish Don't Exist by Lulu Miller. The first thing that popped into my head is the cover of Everybody in This Room Will Someday Be Dead. Because it has a bunch of rabbits on the cover. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop in a bunch of fish <laughs> instead of rabbits. So uh, there's like four colors on this one. So I'm going to choose four colors of my own. It should take place in the ocean. I know it's a nonfiction, but like ocean lake colored background makes sense and then just lay out the title it's kind of ugly um and then of course we need the blurb which is gonna be from our friend amy and that's the cover of why fish don't exist why fish don't exist that's my second favorite it's just pretty <gasps> oh i love it Okay, it's navy blue and gold, which is one of my favorite combinations. I made it um, very silly and illustrated like and goofy. The Jasmine Throne by Tasha Suri. I mean, we've got to put a girl in a throne on the cover. I feel like Jasmine, purple, maybe like mauve tones kind of make sense. Um, there's a ton of people we can find who are sitting in thrones on book covers and just take a lot of inspiration from that. I'm actually just gonna find a photo of somebody already doing that. And like, these are mock-ups. I'm not, they're not gonna be pretty. And we'll just change the color a little bit. And what color font? I don't know. It's gonna be a fantasy story about royalty. And I think this makes sense. Next is the Jasmine throne. Why is it so big? <gasps> Oh, it's not jasmine colored. It's the opposite, which is cool. Hey, Chakra Bordy blurb this one. I feel like I've seen this before. I don't know. She's not in a throne. I like the style. But wow, this is a big book. Now for the last, I realized I was thinking of this book, which is not the same. I kind of want to take the colors from this though, because like what, I have nothing. I'm thinking um, a couple things, like Ascension for some reason is coming to mind. And then this other book that I have, maybe the colors of that. And for some reason I want it to be upside down in like a house, kind of like this. I don't know what gives me kind of futuristic or dystopian apocalyptic vibes, but apparently it's it's this the last i mean that is the most generic looking book i've ever seen in my life is it? flip it oh it's a house i got that right i put like mountainous house oh cool things this doesn't look this is like an apocalypse book oh it doesn't really like a little bit but it looks like the end of a, the white house or something like the that. seven moons of molly almeida i have a cover in mind and I feel like I must have seen this somewhere but I'm just gonna make it and maybe it belongs to another book but naturally like seven moons and moon phases make sense to go across the top and then I want to do um, like a girl dancing or posing or something at the top of a mountain that's what I'm picturing and that's apparently what I think this one looks like. This is the one that, the only one that he couldn't get from the library because it had like a huge wait list. Yeah, I think it was like 15 or 18 or something. Oh, I've seen this before. How beautiful. Yeah. I'm so happy to own this though. I need to find out what all of these are about. Oh, okay. This looks, oh my God. I made the cover this girl looking at the moon. Not the vibe. Do you take this man by Denise Williams? I feel like I recognize Denise Williams' name and I want to put, um, I don't know, do you take this man? I feel like it's going to be at a wedding 
and I'm picturing an illustrated cover but I don't know if I want to like put the effort into that right now so maybe I'll just find a picture of like some people getting married maybe the bride is like um standing at the altar and she's like like I don't know if I want him she's like looking at someone in the crowd or something like that I am picturing it red I'm not sure why so let's see if I can um, put that together and that's that do you take this man oh it's red I made it red I have nothing to say that's stunning I do prefer covers when the faces are cut off a little bit you only have one left like, right like this Yes, I have one left. Okay, good. <laughs> Make sure you got the, all of them. Yeah. Then we've got The Wedding Season by Katie Birchall. And the first thing that came to mind was that she is like a wedding planner and she's waiting for her moment um, and her wedding and her perfect partner. Um, so I picture this girl sitting in a closet in a wedding dress. I don't know what she's doing, but um, what came to mind is like Maya Rudolph, like sitting in the street. Um, and or... Um, whatever her name is, you know, sitting in her wedding dress, eating whipped cream out of a can. So it's a girl and she's sitting in a closet surrounded by like, I don't know if it's wedding dresses or it should be more colorful, but I'm thinking like Sophie Kinsella style that's very simplistic colors with like um, black inky outlines, very old school. And she's just sitting there like alone. I don't know if she's sad, but <laughs> this is her. What's your favorite color? It's my favorite color. Yeah. Are, are you saying that as in not my favorite color? Yeah. Like it's turquoise? Yeah. Or are you saying it's pink? It's both. No way. What? Oh, wow. This is totally the style of the girl. Wait, she kind of looks like the girl I made. I really like this. It does just have one person on the cover, which makes me think it is more of that personal development kind of romance. I have all of the books secured. So, Thank you kindly, husband, for getting them. For which me. cover is your favorite? Thanks so much for asking this one. Yeah. That's figured. crazy. I love it. One of them is much longer than I expected. One of them is much shorter. So I still feel like it fits so into average. a reasonable size reading block. I'm glad you finally got to look at your books that I've been. It's been a while. <laughs> I've really been waffling with how I wanted to kick off this video, like which book to start with. I wanted it to be a win right from the beginning. Um, but what I ultimately decided to do was to bookend it by the two romances because I just feel like these are the ones that I don't know, like that I trust less. It's just that I'm so much more picky within romance than any other genre. I still like don't know what I'm looking for. And just because they're centered around weddings, like there are so many other things that I could dislike or that could give me the ick within these pages. I feel like also just the comments that they came from, I'm sure they were just as thoughtful of recommendations as anything else, but they didn't really have any reasoning behind it besides being about a wedding. And you can tell that from like the title and the cover. So they seem like easier recommendations for somebody to find just like books about weddings here they are. I just recently finished The Worst Best Man and I did not like it. So now I'm worried to go into wedding related ones, but I started this one last night and I even filmed a little clip and then throughout the clip realized that maybe this isn't even a romance. A third of the way in, nothing, like there has been no wedding and no romance. I think I just realized this might not be a romance at all. Because when I said in the video, I divided things into different sections. I said I have a wedding section. I didn't say weddings in a romance book. I just said weddings and I put thrillers in there too. I didn't put any just general fiction, I don't think. But maybe this is just general fiction. But I'm now halfway through it and there is a relationship that has happened. And it's the kind that's gonna make her break out of her shell. It's a kind of dislike to like dynamic, which is fun to read. But there has just been a ton of setup for us to really fall in love with this character. She is simple, she is relatable, she's just a nice, wholesome girl. And she's like a lot of protagonists who is kind of uptight and does things by the book and just has a very strict goals and plans for herself. And now she's letting loose. And the thing that's going on here is that she got dumped at the beginning of the book the day before her wedding by her fiance. And her wedding was kicking off like the wedding season. All of her friends are getting married. There's like seven weddings she's going to attend throughout the next three months. And she still wants to go attend all of those. But now her fiance or her ex-fiance is going to 
be at some of them and she has this really core group of great friends and they give her like a task to complete at each of these weddings to keep her mind off of things to not wallow and to distract her from like that guy being there so one of them is like she needs to dance on the dance floor be the last one on the dance floor in one of them she needs to like get a kiss by the end of the night she needs to like go streaking just like silly um become your true free spirit type challenges and she's rising to the occasion so in addition to it being about weddings it also fits into one of my other categories which is a book that's organized and is done by lists so she has a certain amount of weddings she's attending you know what to expect from each of them now she has a list to complete it's really fun and nice freya is enjoyable to follow i definitely do need the romance to pick up for me to really like this but i feel like because it's been really classic and cliche so far it might also fall into the cliche of at the end she isn't even going to be with this guy or if she is with him it's not about that it's about her learning about herself but then also the cliche perhaps um of her like becoming this whole new free spirit person maybe her ex-fiance is going to come back at the end and be like now you've shown me like who you really are and I do want to be with you after all and she's going to get the moment of denying him and being like no I've moved on I've changed like you didn't deserve me and just getting that boss bitch moment and seeing her really um hit that stride of being herself being confident in what she wants just feels like the trajectory of the story and what we're going to get from her so it hasn't been outside the box and I don't think it's going to and it doesn't need to I am having fun now that we've actually attended a wedding halfway through the book it's fun to follow and I'm having a good time hi friends Rob and I are starting a series of alphabet dates where oh are we we go on dates every two weeks and we had to go in order of the alphabet. So yesterday we went to the arts district and we walked around. And next we're gonna go bowling. So if anyone has any ideas for C and D and E, I'd love to know. And I'll keep you updated on our dating progress. Maybe we'll fall in love. We'll look like that. Okay, I will admit this is a bit of a boring way to kick off the video because the first book was good, but I don't feel anything towards it. And I think I'm just gonna give it an objective like, 3.75. I don't think it should be in the romance category. I just don't know that a story like this, no matter how good it is, just like contemporary fiction following a woman and there's like no huge issues or plot points. Could it ever get a five star? I don't know. Pretty much it hit every single plot point that I thought it would. It was extremely predictable, but that doesn't make it bad. But I most definitely needed it if it was a romance to be steamier, more interesting, better banter. Like we were almost there but that wasn't the point of the story it was Freya's journey and Freya's journey was nice I wouldn't hesitate to recommend this to anybody who loves like Sophie Kinsella or whoever else out there writes books like this because this felt like if her name wasn't on here I would have thought this was Sophie Kinsella shout out to the person who recommended this because it was good it was it was a fine solid recommendation and I might actually read another one a second book today because look how no wait i pulled this over because i was gonna say how wild is it the difference in these sizes but look how small this one is i should read it in a day that's what i think i'm going into all of these without reading the synopsis that's what i've decided so i'll let you know i'll probably just check in with you with my review when i'm done why do i keep like leaving the frame before i'm done talking don't know no idea how popular this book was but I just went on the Goodreads page and it has so many ratings and it even says on the front it's a beloved classic like it probably sounds nuts to some of you that I have never heard of this and that I could even go ahead and predict the cover because I'd never seen it but yeah I'd, I'd never seen it never heard of it uh, there are actually a lot of covers out there for this book because it's a beloved classic it came out in the 70s and it's an epistolary story uh, just from this woman who is a writer in New York between her and mostly this used book dealer in London and then um, she becomes like a frequenter of their shop like they send her books she's looking for certain things and she sends them money in the mail and they send her books and she originally starts talking to the guy and then eventually like the whole shop kind of gets involved and she shares letters with everybody who works there and even like offshoots of that like family members and she just kind of becomes a part of the community because she's 
a, you know, regular customer. She sends them Christmas presents and they just kind of share their lives with each other. But mostly, the, I mean, the correspondence are not so much their lives. Like they check in with each other, like, how have you been? My kids are great, blah, blah, blah. It's mostly about like what books she's looking for and a bunch of just like thank yous. I guess this has become a movie as well. I don't think I'll check it out, but I did give it a four. I thought it was nice and I agree with every single rating and review that I saw that called it charming. I think this is a very charming book. Then I'm moving on to this book, which I've actually already started. I started it as the first book when I was telling you like, I wanna bookend this by romance. It's because I was thinking about DNFing this. I was originally gonna start here and I got like to the halfway point and I was like, I'm gonna put this down and let's just start the video somewhere else. Maybe I'll come back to this, maybe I'll DNF it, I don't know. Because this one, while it fits into the apocalypse thing, I don't know that I'm really liking it and that it's really doing anything particularly interesting. Let me do a quick side note because um, I doubt anybody would recognize this as something that has been on my TBR, but I actually have already owned this book. When I heard of it, it sounded familiar. When I saw the cover, it felt familiar, and it's because I have already owned it. So this was sent to me um, by the publisher. Is it Simon & Schuster? I wanna make sure I'm saying the right thing here. I'm assuming it's Simon & Schuster because I believe it came, okay, it is. It came in these really cool marketing packages that they used to send out to influencers and they would wrap a bunch of mystery books in like newspaper and the articles depicted the story that was inside and it was really fun to unwrap. It was like a little surprise thing. It wasn't solicited, but it was fun. And I just ended up with like, 15 books in that season of my life that they were sending those out that I had like never heard of, wasn't interested in, but it was fun to unbox them and get to share the synopsis with other people and get it into the right hands. And so it's fun that it was like a full circle moment that this guy recommended to me when I feel like I was kind of recommending it and sharing it with other people. I did unhaul it um, like at the end of the year, whatever year was this came, like 2018, 19 maybe. I guess I can check because It'll be the year that it came out, 2019. So I'm sorry that the video is not technically successful because the whole point was books I'd never heard of and I have heard of a couple of them. I just didn't realize that I had heard of them. And also I hope I made it clear, I probably didn't, but like in the cover design portion, it wasn't supposed to be like original artwork or anything. So I did steal from multiple other cover artists and was kind of like, if this book was done by Lenny Kaufman, who maybe who maybe was the person who did it, I had no idea. That's one of my favorite cover artists. So like, I just took a portion of a book that I saw from her and then mocked up a cover. So we're following this guy named John Keller. He's on a work trip in Switzerland when the world ends. And basically the book opens up with um, all of these people who are staying in this hotel deciding what to do. There's 20 people and they're in this very isolated environment. They only are communicating with each other. They're kind of cut off from the rest of the world and they don't really know what has gone on elsewhere, if other people have survived it, if they should leave and try to find other people. And they're essentially spending a lot of time creating like their own society because they have to. And I don't love that setup. I don't love the decisions of like, who's gonna be in charge and who's listening to who and the fight for power, talking about everything that they have and dividing it up and is this gonna be enough? And obviously these are things that have to happen and discussions that have to be had. I just find it a little bit dull. It's reminding me of how I was feeling reading The Centaur's Wife, which has a similar setup. I think maybe I like apocalyptic books better if it's an established community like in the Wabgishig Rice one that I can't, Moon of the Crested Snow, or when we're not at the beginning of the situation, like Station Eleven, that we are in different timelines and like in well-established, like deep into the end of the world situations. But then there's a mystery plot in here because some of the people find um, a dead girl in the hotel. I just grabbed the audiobook because I figured if I'm not loving it, I can just listen to it and get through it just to see if it does anything more interesting. Like there's a lot of relationships building, there's romantic things going on, there is this mystery, but it's not really the point. Um, and now it's getting a little bit like maybe unsettling for the group because they have to make a decision if they want to venture out of the hotel. Now there is another threat that's been introduced besides like starvation and survival. So this one was a three, which isn't terrible. I haven't read a terrible book so far. And I think like, honestly, we can count that as a win as far as my 2023 reading. But don't worry, because I really feel like we have a five star in here. I don't know which one it's gonna be, but I sense it. I sense a five star coming. This absolutely checked multiple boxes. I just think it was a little bit 
uninteresting. The main character is one that makes sense that the author decided to write. He's not someone that you would call particularly likable or unlikable. He's just there. You find out what led up to this nuclear devastation, not as far as like political and global stuff, like how it happened, though some things are inferred, but more so like I'm talking what led up to these characters being in this situation, like how this man ended up here, what his relationship was like before. It does remain pretty insular the entire time, so expect like a really character driven literary vibe to it. The mystery itself that kicked this whole thing off it doesn't remain like at the forefront the entire book and then the ending revolves around that and explains it and I just didn't like the ending. In my mind this has to be inspired by the real event that happened at the Cecil Hotel um, and so I find it strange that that is not mentioned as far as like acknowledgments or resources or anything. But yeah, I'm leaving this one at a three and I'll check in with you next time I pick up a book. Good morning, my friends. I am just getting ready for the day. I put on um, too much blush, but maybe my face is still actually a little bit red from a walk this morning. Liam went for a bike ride. I went for a walk. I really need to go ahead and get myself a bike because I bought a bike rack that fits two bikes, so. I can and I should. But today I'm just starting The Seven Moons of Mali Almeida. This is by Shahan Karanatelica and um, I think obviously at this point looking at it now I realize I have heard of it because it was like literally the Booker Prize winner in 2022. When I was just reading it in the comments it sounded like so many other book titles out there that feature an eponymous character. Like you know there's the Death of Viva Goji and the storied life of AJ Fickery and the death of Jane Lawrence and the 10,000 doors of January. The blank of blank is so common and it's also really common or most common I see in like middle grade. So many of them start with A's. There's Arusha and Amari. I think there's one called like Amina's Voice and Anya's Ghost, Lizzie Albright. So it just sounded like it was probably one of those. And I would have been totally down to read like uh, ghosty, you know, middle grade. But what's happening in this one, I only read the first chapter, but we do have this character named Molly and he has died. And the book opens with him, I guess, like going to the afterlife. And there's a whole bunch of other people trying to enter the afterlife. And it's like this fight to get to the front of the line. And he's being asked all these questions and he doesn't really know how he died or when he died or how it all worked. And then the person at the front, the gatekeeper or the spirit or whatever, um, says something about seven moons. Like you have seven moons. So you have seven days to talk to everyone you've wanted to, like finish maybe all of your unfinished business or get certain answers. I don't really understand what's happening from here. But that was the kickoff and I know that it's set in the late 80s into 1990 and the civil war in Sri Lanka which is not a piece of history I'm super familiar with anyway so I think what I've heard from other people is that it gives you an equal amount of story and narrative to follow but also like information and learnings to be there are to be offered in here which I think will be really interesting. I have a couple things to film today so I might not check in with you until later this evening when I have a chance to sit down and really read. I just forgot I have this giant clip in my hair. Like it's comically large but it holds all of my flyaways in. This is what my hair looks like after it's been sweaty in a ponytail for an hour. Anyway, cute. Hello, I didn't read much today. I didn't vlog at all today. Um, I hurt my back. Oh, I haven't had back pain in like over a year and this just brought back all the memories. Anyway, I feel bad. And I read a section of this. It's actually organized. I don't remember if the person said it has to do with life and death. And the other thing that I really love is that it's organized. So if they did say that in the comment, because it's been like months now since I looked at that. Thank you very much for mentioning it. Uh, because it's organized by the seven moons or the seven days. And I still don't think I fully have a grasp on like what the goal is. But one thing I didn't mention is it's written in second person, which I love. Hold on, I need to put this down. So it's as if you are Molly and that's making it fun. So I'm 84 pages in and I'm now at the second moon. And basically Molly has lost their memory. So it doesn't remember how they died. I can't remember if I mentioned that already, but like doesn't remember a lot of things that happened. So they keep appearing um, in these different moments in time leading up to his death. 
and we just get a little snippet and it's him being like, I don't remember this person. I don't remember this conversation. I don't remember anything that's happening. So that makes it fun because it's not like flashbacks because even he doesn't really know what's going on, I guess. Um, Rob brought me home flowers because I sent him a funny TikTok the other day, or actually it was just last night, of this girl and her like boyfriend came home and she shoved flowers at him and then kicked him out of the house. And then when he came back in, she was like, oh my God, I had the flowers. It's funnier if you watch it and I don't tell you, but then he came home with flowers. So he got the hint. What are you watching? We're watching Stargate SG-1 from 98. He's patiently waiting for the bear to come back tomorrow. But we don't really, no, I don't. Ow, my back, help. Oh my God, you know what I just realized? For our alphabet B date, we could go see Barbie. Barbie, let's do it. Or we could wait until D and we could go to the drive-in to see Barbie. Which means we have to do B and C before. Yeah, like real quick. We have to go bowling and canoeing before <laughs> next week. I'm actually a little bummed because I was supposed to film a couple things today that are very like physically involved today and tomorrow and I cannot do them. Uh, so I'm thinking maybe I will even bump up this video. My reading update is I'm still reading Mali Almedi. I'm halfway through. We've made it through like four of the moons and I think it's okay. I haven't felt a lot towards it, but I've been learning things. I think it's generally interesting. Um, naturally, we're just coming off of summer ween, so I'm getting into the spooky season feeling. And I saw some people posting on um, Instagram that their home goods in the States was starting to have like Halloween decor. And so I thought I would go ahead and check out HomeSense. I don't know if it'll be the case here, but I saw some really cute pillows. So I'm just gonna look around. Liam's here with me. It's summer breaks, so we're hanging out. And he's so excited to come in and pick out pillows with me. He's shaking his head. He's very excited. He's not excited. We're home now. We grab groceries. Um, Homesense did not indeed have anything new in Halloween-y. I think they pulled out some leftover like pumpkin stuff from last year. It was not particularly cute. So I'll continue to keep my eye out. The one thing I did find though is a new like lap desk thing for your laptop because the one that I have right now, I'll show you in just a sec. Um, but we also stopped at Value Village right after and I found one thing, but I was excited to find it because it's Men We Reaped, which I read recently and it was the cover that I didn't prefer from the library. And so I thought I would have to buy a physical copy like brand new, but I found that one at the thrift store. What am I looking for? Oh yeah, my laptop. I don't know what the brand is of my old one, but I got it from Indigo. I don't see anything on it, but I don't recommend the ones from Indigo because they peel. They have like this little thin layer of plastic and I've only had this for like a year, year and a half. And it's just completely peeled all up at the bottom. And like, maybe that's where my laptop puts out heat, but either way, it shouldn't, it shouldn't do that if it's intended purposes for a laptop. So this one is from Fringe. Anyway, I'm gonna finish my book now. I'm really slogging through it, to be honest. Like, I don't know why it's not holding my attention, if it's me or if it's the book, but I'm gonna wrap it up and then I'll give you my rating. Okay, I finally finished it. I am gonna have to give this a three. I feel like it had so many qualities that I like and it felt like a mix of two books that I gave five stars, like Glory meets the death of a Vigoji. As far as like who it's focused on and the big cast of characters and it being satirical and it being about a death, I guess I also have to throw a third book in there. Magical realism or surrealism. So I really do think this was the perfect recommendation and I don't know if I can explain why it wasn't for me. I just think it was far too long. Like this just took me I think it was four days to read, which is unheard of. It literally took every single one of my brain cells to read. Like it has beautiful language, but at the same time, it was, it just, I don't know how to explain it. It took so much of my focus. I couldn't read this casually. I like had to put everything that I had into understanding everything. There were so many characters and there are two main ones, but I just don't feel like they stood out in a way or we got to know them in a way that I really wanted. So the plot of this, um, once he is dead, he has these seven moons to like, you know, figure stuff out. And he has two main goals. One of them is to find out, find out how he died and who killed him, if that's what happened. And the second one is, 
he wants to expose or get these like photographs released. So a lot of the book is talking about these photos. Do you have the photos? Where are the photos? Give me the photos. I'll give you money for the photos. What is in the photos? And all of these people trying to figure out this stuff because he was a journalist and he was working on this like expose regarding, you know, government, political and war type figureheads and he was going to expose this whole thing that obviously you learn in the book so I don't want to tell you. So he spends these hundreds and hundreds of pages following his two friends around and just like seeing what their lives are like and just seeing if they're going to figure anything out. So those are his two main relationships. We have the one guy who he's dating and then the girl who he's pretending to date in order to stay safe and um, remain like closeted publicly but then there just ended up being like too many moving parts and too many people we were hearing about and so many scenarios and so many storylines that it lost me but it feels like a solid three still because like I love the second person narration I think this character was interesting unlikable very clearly defined as a character which I enjoy you understood his motivations and it was generally enjoyable I really thought this would be the one I thought I was gonna love this I already have a beautiful Instagram picture of it in my shelves planned to post I did not realize how quickly I was getting through this audiobook I listened to it solely via audio or I would have like stopped and updated you but before I knew it it was over so I just turned this on and started listening to it while I was getting ready and accomplishing a couple little tasks and I finished it in under two hours suddenly it just ended and I had no idea like what what was even happening so this is why fish don't exist by lulu miller i completely forgot why this one was recommended besides it being like an informative memoir so the list of things that came along with it i had it had left my brain so if i had updated you at the halfway point i probably would have said something like i have no idea what's going on like i don't know why this is what we're talking about i don't know what the point of any of this is i don't know what the author is trying to convey with this information. Popping onto the Goodreads, I see that this also is super successful. A lot of people have read it. A lot of people have loved it. It was in the Goodreads Choice Awards. I don't know where I've been, I'm so sorry. But since so many people have read this, I'm also going to include like spoilers, not really like full, full spoilers, even though there shouldn't really be spoilers for nonfiction. Lulu Miller is telling us about this man. I literally have never read the synopsis. I didn't read it before starting. So David Starr Jordan, he's a taxonomist and his whole career is about like categorizing things and labeling things and he apparently is responsible for naming like one-fifth of the world's fish and so the book talks a lot about this guy and how he persevered through all of these things so he would like catch all these fish and then label them and then there'd be like an earthquake or a fire and all the fish would lose their labels like the jars would break and he would lose and he would have to start all over again multiple times labeling like physically labeling these fish so every time he has to kind of restart and work through things he develops different systems so he will like sew the labels onto the fish instead of being in jars etc and I literally just did not know like what the point of any of this was I was like okay am I just gonna be reading this man's like this is just a history of this man me thinking this is supposed to be an informative memoir so who is this about is it about David or is it about Lulu and it is about Lulu's experience learning about this guy and the impact that watching him persevere through all of these things like what it teaches her and her takeaways because maybe she's struggling in certain aspects of her life and as she's learning about this guy um at like I don't even know probably the halfway point she finds out that he's like a terrible guy and he agreed and like encouraged and was responsible for um forced uh sterilization and he like loves eugenics and he's a white supremacist and he's just like awful so at that point I was just so curious what the point was like is this just a history of him is that the intent or is she trying to say something about something like she gained all of these things but he's a bad person but so like people are multifaceted and even if people are awful we have things to learn from them the last chapter was really good and it did wrap up some things I don't know if I fully grasped what she wanted me to get but I think I'm gonna leave it with a four because I think it was well written and I think it was interesting and I think it was really well paced for a nonfiction. 
um, the times that she introduces certain things. And I just feel like uh, this guy is was the president of Stanford for a portion of his life. And he is obviously really well known. So this aspect isn't something that she like uncovered, I don't think. So anybody who already knows this man and already knows about like sterilization in the 1900s especially, I would imagine the reader would already know who this man is and the things that he's done. But to me, it was like a reveal. I don't know how to feel about this one, but that is my rating. And the title comes from the idea that like, um, things do not exist until they have names. And I'm just realizing there are beautiful illustrations in here, like absolutely stunning, that I completely missed out on. I think I would recommend it. It's generally well liked. I need to look into some like reviews and maybe there's like a podcast and stuff that I can consume and get other people's perspective on things. But I am gonna move along to the next book now. This is the start of a chunky, fantasy trilogy. This is 530 pages. It's called The Jasmine Throne by Tasha Suri. We've got a map to enjoy. We have multiple POVs. Priya and Malini. Are they sisters? Are they twin? Oh, we also have a shock. Are they like princess and maid kind of thing? Do they steal each other's identity? Where is the synopsis? Oh, that's all there is. Princess Malini dreams of vengeance. Her brother has trapped her in a temple. Maidservant Priya dreams of freedom. And they're gonna set the empire ablaze. Oh yeah, this is the one about um, women's love prevailing through horrific circumstances. So, oh yeah, it's sapphic. Gotta love when you press record and it says you have a low battery. I'm not going to get a new battery. I'm gonna fit everything I wanna say in the next 20 seconds. I'm halfway through, which I think is pretty great progress for it being like four in the afternoon now. So like it says, Princess Malini is trapped by her brother. She is imprisoned. He is controlling a lot of things. Um, there has been entire groups of people who have been harmed. There's colonization that is going on and that we're talking about. And so there's also like rebels and people fighting against you know, everything going on. So it's a forbidden love, but also like forbidden magic. And that makes it fun. There is more POVs than I mentioned, than I saw. Um, the one that I showed you before is the brother. So we get his insight every once in a while, but then a couple other people. I pause right here because we just had a quote that I thought was really um, beautifully written. There's a moment where Malini is crying and she's sharing with her mother um, her emotions. And I think it's a conversation about like being vulnerable, but also using tears as manipulation. Her mother's comforting her and says, weeping does not make you any less yourself. Be careful with your tears, they're blood of the spirit. Weep too much and it will wear you thin until your soul is like a bruised flower. And then Malini is challenging that internally. Um, it says, her mother had been wrong though. Weep enough and your nature becomes like stone battered by water until it is smooth and impervious to hurt. Use tears as a tool for long enough and you will forget what real grief feels like. So I'm almost done with it and I haven't checked in with you because I just feel like I have no real takeaways. I feel like I'm enjoying Malini and Priya and their very slow burn and their like personal growth and everything that they're going through. I just saw somewhere that this has been marketed as having like two morally gray protagonists and I could not disagree more. I just don't think that that represents them. So if you're someone who like dislikes morally gray characters, because I know a lot of people love it, so there must be a good amount of people out there too that are like enough of the moral grayness of it all. This doesn't have that. So if you like were turned off because of that, pick it up. I think this recommendation already like checks out for me because it is similar to other books that I've read and enjoyed. I I really think that my rating of this is not going to be fair. I don't feel this very often, but I think I'm just really struggling with my attention span right now. Again, I've been reading this for days now, which is fine because of how like big it is. Like it totally makes sense, but I just find myself constantly like do we, is this scene like really necessary? Do I need to know all 10 of these POVs? Do I need to remember all of these people? Like when I pick up the next book in the series, if I'm going to, am I gonna need to remember who everyone was? Are they all that important? Because I don't care about anybody too much besides the two 
main girls. I think I also just like underestimated how much Liam being on summer vacation was going to disrupt my like normal routine because like I talked about earlier this year he's too old for like any of the camps so we've just been spending a lot of time together and I'm regularly entertaining him. He is now in a hockey camp but it's only like an hour and a half so we're finally back in the arena after two months and it feels really good. So I am going to go in. He's just getting dressed now and I'll finish this up. Oh, actually I'll finish it up even quicker than I thought because look how much acknowledgements and extras and stuff is at the end. So I've really only got this chunk. This is one of those cases again, that there is such a complex magic system and there's so much political intrigue and moving parts that I don't even have the vocabulary to explain like what it's doing well and what it's not doing well. What I can say is the stakes feel very high for both of these women and what they are dealing with and how they're trying to get out of their circumstances and everybody that they're battling along the way. Um, but while the stakes feel high, I also feel like the plot isn't totally matching that. Like the bad things that are happening don't feel as intense as they could, but it is like a dark one. It's not like Daughter of the Moon Goddess where every at every turn, like things just work out for her and it's kind of a cozier vibe. This is dark. It is graphic. It's reminding me too of Girls of Paper and Fire, which is interesting. Maybe it's because it's just shorter and this just feels a little too long for me. But in that one, we were all in the same place, like the entire book and I loved it and gave it five stars. This one, I feel like we should be having more movement. Like we should be going more places, more things should be happening happening because it kind of feels like, well, not a prologue, but if we knocked it in half and got through things a little bit quicker, it feels like it's a prologue because she's just trying to get out of her imprisonment. And then I can't even imagine where the story is going to go from there in the rest of the books. It's slow and it's detailed. And I think that in different parts of my reading life, that's something that I've appreciated. But right now, I think it's just me. I don't think it's the book, which is definitely a bummer because I'm behind on my reading and on my videos. <laughs> Summer's just getting away from me. Uh, so I'm going to head in, I'm going to finish it up and I'll just pop in with a final rating. I'm home and I'm giving it a three and a half. I really did like that last chunk. In fact, it even talked about amongst the characters morality, why people are choosing to do certain things and the power that you have, you know, running this empire, what should be expected of you, um, the impact you could have. And then there was also some magic within the ending that's like water based. And I really like nature focused magic. I don't know that this is categorized anywhere as fantasy romance. I don't think it is, but because it was suggested to me as far as like women's love prevailing and there is a relationship going on in it, I think it could lead you to think this is much more romance than it is. It's not, it's not fantasy romance, it's fantasy romance. And I also think it's a lot more political than magic. That's just me trying to get it into the right hands, not like reviewing it or critiquing it at this point. And while it is, women's love prevailing. It is more individual stories and the way that they support each other and they're um, really focused on getting what they want and need out of their lives. And the reason that they're doing certain things and supporting each other and helping each other isn't solely because like they're madly in love. Like I never got that vibe at all. It was because there are morals at play and expectations of yourself. There was also some interesting reveals and progression and like passing of the torch towards the end that definitely sets itself up well for a series. I really do like these characters. They're strong in their beliefs, even when they can't be strong physically. There is one of the characters who is, I mean, incapacitated for a good portion of the book, which is why I think you can't assign gray morality because she's incapacitated and she's in a different headspace and uh, survival mode as well. I think it was good. I'm giving it a three. I think epic fantasy, sometimes I'm in the right headspace for it and sometimes I'm not. Okay, so today is all about Do You Take This Man by Denise Williams. I think it's pretty impressive that I don't think I've ever seen this cover before. And I got, like, it's pink and red, and I did more of an orangey red, but I feel like I partially got the vibe, even though obviously everything is stolen from like other book covers and whatnot. Um, I knew Denise Williams was a black author because people have recommended me something about falling. Let me check. The fastest way to fall. And then she also has How to Fail at Flirting, which is so interesting because both of these books 
you can just see the back of the characters and so maybe like subconsciously that's why I wanted to put the back of the man on mine. Anyway, I have read the first chapter of this, not knowing anything about it, and we're following this lawyer named RJ. I think it was RJ, yes. And she did like a, what's it called when you officiate a wedding? Um, she did it for these two people, and I guess her, I guess that went viral or something. And so now she's in high demand for people to do that at their wedding. So she has like a day job and is a divorce attorney. So the opening chapter kicks off with like her leaving work and going to um, officiate a wedding. And while she, when she gets there, she runs into this guy and she is so mean to him and like blames him for running into her. She ran into him. He was standing in the middle of the sidewalk. She was in a rush. She's very important and she was a little bitchy. So we've got, I think it's a grumpy, grumpy dynamic because he it doesn't seem very likable at this point, but we got a chapter from his perspective and he was at the same location that the wedding was taking place showing a bride and her mom around the venue because he is a wedding planner. His perspective was a little bit rough to read just because it's funny. I was watching um, a video from Chandler and her husband recently and they were um, reading a book together and reviewing it. The Dumb Bitch Book Club is what they do. And he was talking about something so funny that was perfectly embodied in that first chapter. And I just couldn't help but think about it. And it's when like the male love interest, especially when it's written by a woman, is like angry at a woman. He was like pissed off. She was being mean. And, but then he can't stop thinking about how sexy she is. And he was like, but she does have a beautiful neck. And I was like, what are we talking about? Like she just ran into you. She was mean, but you're like, I can't stop looking at her stunning neck. I saw that the audiobook has a male and female narrator. So I think maybe I will pick that up because I need to get like a man's voice in my head because right now I'm struggling and maybe actually listening to somebody do it. It'll come across better because he was talking to um, the bride and she just seems to me like a dumb blonde and maybe that's how I'm reading it but it wouldn't be how he reads it. The guy's name is Lear, L-E-A-R, and the first time the bride meets him um, she literally goes, oh Penny sent you. She said you'd be tall and well-dressed and oh my you are. How lovely. She didn't say you'd be so good-looking but of course you are. <laughs> and then on the next page she's talking about the wedding um, that I think RJ was officiating and she was describing it and goes, it was in the park and it was totes cute. Just like all the feels. But I feel like maybe she's being introduced as just like this silly bubbly um, person just to show a comparison between like the sexy smart lawyer. Nothing about it is bad. I just don't know if the writing is really gonna mesh with me. Um, but that it was just the first I think two chapters that I read because one from each perspective. And yeah I'll, I'll check in with you when I know more. Can I just love a romance? Like can I please? Can I please? Whoever's in charge here. I just need a five star romance. I just need to feel alive. I think honestly, I'm also a little bummed out because we just finished, <laughs> we just finished watching The Bear. We've been marathoning the second season and I did not like it. I did not like the romance subplot and how much it was there. Like that is not why I signed up for this show. Oh God. As much as I was looking forward to the Will Poulter cameo, I really feel like there was an entire unnecessary episode that just went on way too long because they wanted to put every celebrity cameo. The second half of the season was better. Um, the episode immediately after the like Christmas episode, that was amazing. Richie's arc, sure. Anyway, I got this new bookmark in the mail that says pause. It's from the same brand that did that swirly kind of bookmark that I have and love. I haven't finished the book yet. I'm on chapter 34 of 49. So I'm going to wrap it up soon, but I just already know this isn't a five star, but it's one of those situations that happens with so many romances this year for me is like, I can't really explain why. And I think I'm going on a romance hiatus, at least publicly. They are both really annoyed by each other, but very sexually attracted to each other. And so they're like having a lot of sex now, but constantly fighting their own feelings and talking about how they like shouldn't be together. But there's like obviously some nicer moments where they realize the other person isn't as bad as they seem and that their judgments were not fair and like blah, 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 blah. And the wedding vibes are there. Like there is wedding related stuff going on, but I've just lost interest, which is a bummer. 
And that's a wrap on the experiment. I'm gonna give this three stars. I just didn't feel like either of the characters are ones uh, it's not that you don't get to know them and also maybe it's just me but I just didn't feel connected to either of them and I did not see their connection. I don't think they're the perfect person for each other though I definitely think sexual chemistry was there. Those scenes were fine. I had no issue there though if you are looking for it to get steamy it's like steamy and then it just stops and it's kind of a drag because we've got obviously the third act conflict and I would just prefer honestly it to be the dreaded miscommunication third act conflict rather than this which was them like spewing their anger at each other and like telling each other their flaws in like a heated argument and the thing is like you can't take that back and now my memory of these characters will be like the things that they said in anger and not the ways that they made up for it and apologized which they did also you could say that fit with their characters they were kind of unlikable people <laughs> they both had very strong personalities and right from the very beginning the way that they meet and he tells her she needs to smile more and so at least you know denise williams is committed to the characters and now i'm like reworking it in my mind of what i would prefer to happen and maybe if like he already knew who she was at the beginning and maybe he was trying to impress her and then just like messed it up or assumed like that's the kind of partner that she would want and that's how he was trying to woo her like maybe there's some type of explanation in there but the way that it actually panned out i just didn't love it the wedding vibes were there they weren't as like warm or fun as i wanted it got sad they cried they came together in those moments and like that's beautiful but i don't know i was never fully committed to them and this isn't the most memorable romance for me so i think it's gonna be a three because like it was written well maybe it's a 2.75 i don't really know the experiment is over naturally starting a video with saying these are kind of five star predictions i wanted them all to be five stars and they most definitely weren't but we had some hits mostly i don't feel like they were huge misses and i really hope that this doesn't um stop anybody from ever giving me more recommendations because i really love them i really appreciate them anybody who took the time to even think of a book that i might like based on these silly little categories like thank you so much for being here and contributing to an experiment like this and i will see you in the next one Bye.